Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to be here. And um, as Michael said, uh, the purpose of this talk is to, uh, just to, to kind of walk through what we've learned about the, both the structure and the nucleus uh, in terms of uh, the substructures of both objects uh, from uh, uh, measurements that we've uh, done at the NHC and, and some theoretical um, comparisons to try and interpret these, these measurements. So uh, just for the uh, um, people that are not so familiar with uh, particle and nuclear physics, I just wanted to, to, to have some intro slides to, to uh, help you guys out. So this at the moment is our standard model of, of elementary particles. These are all the uh, fundamental particles that we know of, actually the, the photon is missing, it, 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 it should be there. Uh, but these are the smallest particles. Some of them you may, may recognize, the electron, I hope, uh, maybe the muon. Uh, some of them uh, perhaps are not so familiar. Uh, hopefully uh, some of you have heard of the Higgs. And then when you add the photon, these are all the fundamental particles that, that we have seen. Um, now for my research, um, we are interested in these type of particles, which are known as quarks. And you can see uh, they come in um, uh, uh, these sorts of groups. So you have up, charm, top, down, strains, bottom. And these are the corresponding antiparticles. And uh, the gluon is uh, what we refer to as the exchange particle that mediates the force between each of the quarks. The theory that describes these interactions is something that we refer to as quantum chromodynamics, or QCD. You're going to hear that quite a bit in the talk, so please remember what uh, uh, QCD means. Um, and yeah, it's, it's the best theory that we have at the moment that, that describes the interaction between the quarks via the exchange uh, uh, of the gluon uh, its, itself. So where do we find them, right? So the table looked kind of funky, but it turns out quite, uh, quarks are quite common in nature. Uh, they're actually, uh, interactions between quarks are actually responsible for about 98% of the mass of the uh, observable universe. And where do you find them? So you've seen this picture of the atom. You have a nucleus here, consists of protons and neutrons. You have electrons that uh, exist in the vicinity. Um, a proton contains two up quarks and one down quark. A neutron contains uh, one up quark and, and two down quarks. The quarks themselves carry electrical charge. So when you add up uh, the up quark electrical charge of two thirds and the down quark electrical charge of minus one third, you get plus one for this and you get an electrical charge of, of zero for this. So they are fundamental building blocks of nature. And as I said before, uh, they're not the mass of the quarks themselves, but it turns out their interactions between each other and the energy associated with that, because energy and mass are equivalent, are responsible for uh, most of the mass that we see in the observed nu nucleus um, uh, universe. <laughs> now, there's a particular state of matter at the LHC that, that we are interested in, and it's something called the quark gluon plasma. So what you have here is, uh, in principle, these could be four neutrons, four protons, but uh, four of these uh, composite objects, right, which, which the quarks are contained within. It turns out that if you either heat these to extreme temperatures or you apply extreme pressures, either, either approach achieves the same thing, uh, you can actually delocalize these quarks such that this notion of the quarks existing in either the protons or neutrons or any sort of hadron start to become meaningless. They, the quarks themselves become the relevant degrees of, 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 of freedom. And this is what we refer to as the quark gluon plasma. So it's called that because you have quarks in there. Uh, it's called uh, gluon, comes to the fact that the gluons are exchanged between the quarks. And the word plasma comes from the fact that there is uh, a a charge, so to speak, uh, which is not the electric charge, it's the strong charge that's, uh, 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 the, that these quarks um, actually have in order to keep them bound in, in a proton or neutron. 
And when you heat them up, then you essentially go from objects that have a no color charge to these objects that, that have uh, a, a color charge. And uh, just like a plasma in uh, the normal sense, where you heat up a gas, at some point the, uh, the, the gas becomes, the constituents becomes ele electrically charged. What happens in this case is uh, our fluid, so to speak, the constituents actually have a color charge. And that's not actually the case uh, uh, for protons and neutrons, which, which are color neutral. Is it uh, interesting? Um, so some people believe this pushes the analogy uh, uh, a little bit far, but it's something we use nonetheless. So uh, you've all seen this picture of the Big Bang, the evolution of the universe. If uh, this state of matter exists at extremely high temperatures, it stands to reason at the very early stages of the universe when it was extremely hot, you would have had uh, uh, a universe that was more like a quark gluon plasma as opposed to a universe that consists of protons and neutrons and electrons in their separate way. So um, we expect the universe existed in, in this uh, uh, state for, for, it would have been quite a short time, but it would have existed in there uh, nonetheless. And this is the high temperature example. And there are objects in the universe that exist now that have extremely high pressures and densities, right? So if you can achieve a quark gluon plasma via just, just, just pushing these protons and neutrons together so the quarks uh, get, get released, so to speak, or delocalized, um, you can achieve this in, 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 uh, in a neutron star, in particular at the core of the neutron star. So um, we don't know this for a fract, but it's been hypothesized that when you get down to those pressures, this type of matter uh, uh, exists. So. Um, these are two examples as, as to why it's interesting. Uh, ideally, when you study the properties of the QGP, maybe you learn something about this, or maybe you learn something about this. Um, I'm actually going to show you something else that, that we learn, um, but that's often how, uh, uh, how we motivate why we do. OK, so having established that, that this is a, uh, a, a state of matter, you can, of course, ask yourself how much heat or what temperature do you need to cause nuclear matter to melt, right? Because essentially that's what's going on. Um, it turns out uh, a implementation of quantum chronodynamics called lattice quantum chronodynamics can actually uh, 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 give us an indication of, of the typical temperatures required. So what they do is, is they calculate uh, the pressure of uh, um, the constituents divided by the temperature to, to the four and you look at this versus the temperature, and what you see around temperatures of uh, 200 uh, MeV is this, 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 this quite rapid change in, in, in the pressure. And that is uh, the best way to interpret, to interpret this is uh, this is a sign that you've gone from color neutral objects with low interactions to color charged objects with strong interactions, and this has uh, an effect on, on the pressure of, of the gas that you see. Pressure itself is linked to. Uh, uh, into interactions between the constituents. How hot um, does 200 MeV? So it's very easy to convert MeV to Celsius, and, uh, well, not actually to Celsius, uh, but to, well, it is to Celsius and to Fahrenheit and to Kelvin. If you convert this to, to uh, Fahrenheit, you get a temperature of, of five, uh, I think that's 5,000 billion Fahrenheit. So extremely hot, about a million times higher than the temperature of the center of, of the sun. So you really need extreme conditions to, to create this. Um, and part of this is the fact that the quarks in the protons and the neutrons, they're very strongly bound. So you need to put a lot of energy to, to sort of unbind them. Unbind them. Um, so the next question is, you know, how do we, how do we create uh, a state of matter that we can actually study uh, in, in, the, in the laboratory? Um, it's, it's quite crude, but effective in, in, in my point of view. Uh, what we do is we collide uh, uh, lead nuclei at extremely high energies. And what happens is essentially uh, the kinetic energy at these extremely high energies gets converted to heat, to, to a temperature. And um, this is uh, what we believe, how it goes. So you collide your lead nuclei. You convert all this uh, kinetic energy to heat. This melts the constituents of nuclear matter. You then have a QGP, which will expand like anything does, uh, that's, that's very hot. At some point, it will cool down to the temperature where you go from a quark gluon plasma back to sort of protons, neutrons, and, and other types of hadrons. Um, uh, 
And we refer to that as, as uh, uh, the confinement stage because the quarks re then become confined uh, in the protons and neutrons and, and other hadrons. Um, this is a hadronic gas, and then uh, at some point we have something called chemical freeze-out. In chemical freeze-out, what happens is the, the chemical composition of this hadronic gas uh, stops changing after a particular time. You get to kinetic freeze-out, uh, where the, the momentum of the constituents stops changing. They, they, the chances they interact are very, very small. And then at some point, you measure what comes out of these collisions with the detectors at, at the LHC. So the point to take away is we can't measure this thing directly. We have to infer through the evolution of the system what happens based on what happens at the end. So it's kind of a smoking gun uh, sorts of thing. But we, but we can, and we've learned a lot by, by doing so. Right. QGP at the lab. Where do we make it? Uh, so it stands to reason that if you want a lot of energy and you want to study this, you should probably move to a collider that can provide the greatest energies of these collisions. And, and that's what the LHC is able to do. Um, so this is somewhat of a complicated diagram, but the, the heavy ions uh, essentially start in these regions and get boosted, accelerated more, boosted, accelerated more. And then they end up in the Large Hadron Collider ring where you have uh, two beams going in opposite directions. And those beams are made to collide at particular points where we have the experiments, right? Um, so I work on the ALICE experiment. We have a very strong group here that works on the CMS experiment. Uh, uh, we actually also, people are also interested in heavy ions in, in the LHCB and, and the ATLAS experiment as well. So all of these experiments study these lead lead collisions beyond the proton-proton, which perhaps they're, they're, more, they're more famous for. In terms of what we've collided, so we've collided lead at 2.76 in our first running period, uh, proton lead in 5.02. And then the second running period, we were able to increase the collision energy by, by a factor of two. So lead went up to 5.02. We also collided xenon, P lead again, and P lead again. And what I didn't mention is, is proton proton, which is something we've also been, been looking at. And uh, also turns out to be quite interesting for our own, for our own studies. Now, in particular, what I'm interested in, of course, I'm interested in the QGP, but I'm also interested in the initial state. What happens just before the QGP evolution, and, and how does that affect uh, how the QGP behaves when you make it? And I'll try and give an example here. So here you have two uh, lead nuclei, or they could be gold nuclei if, if you were working at RIC. Uh, they have hit each other, and they have created this, this almond shape like, uh, like zone, where uh, we think the QGP uh, exists. Now, the QGP itself is able to translate what we refer to as a spatial anisotropy. By spatial anisotropy, I simply mean the thing's not spherical, right? Something's anisotrop, uh, ana uh, uh, something has uh, an anis anisotropic, beg your pardon, it's spherical. If it's anisotropic, it's not. So you have the spatial anisotropy, and it gets converted to a momentum anisotropy. What that means is you have a larger pressure gradient in this direction compared to uh, 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 the upwards direction. Where you have larger pressure gradients, you have a greater amount of flow, right? So um, that essentially means you get more momentum in, in these directions and these directions relative to the y direction, which, which is up. And uh, this is a common thing in, in, in fluid dynamics. Uh, here we have an experiment. These are, uh, uh, these are atoms trapped at, uh, at low temperatures in a magnetic field. And they're trapped in this shape. And then you release the magnetic field. What you find is the atoms uh, here move to, uh, uh, move to uh, in these directions much more vigorously than they move in these directions. So they start to get pushed out by these, these, uh, these pressure gradients. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's the same sort of thing. It turns out the QGP is much more efficient at, at uh, translating the spatial anisotropy to a momentum anisotropy compared to any other fluid that, that we've seen. And it's actually related to how strong the constituents interact with, with each other. Um, now, I talked about this spatial anisotropy. So the fact that the initial collagen region is, isn't a circle um, 
Now, unfortunately, this this uh, this picturization of what it looked like, what it looks like, is not entirely accurate in a, uh, in itself. Um, what we have here uh, are two ways of looking at the initial spatial anisotropy. Uh, one way is to do a calculation using the uh, what's called the Monte Carlo Glauber model, where essentially you say that the thing that controls the shape of this thing is determined by the positions of, of the nucleons, right? Which presumably makes sense. A nucleus consists of nucleons. And the overlap region is going to be some summation of, of that. So, um, and when you do these calculations, what you find is, it's hard to see, but there actually is an almond shape here. But what you find, there's also uh, a, a lumpiness uh, in, in this initial state. It's not a smooth almond. It has lumps. And these simply come from, from quantum fluctuations. Another approach is actually uh, to say that uh, uh, in the nucleus, uh, let's, not, um, let, let's not use nucleons as the degrees of freedom that, that make this thing, uh, 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 and, uh, that, that, that cause this shape. Let's calculate uh, uh, from first principles, from QCD, what the gluon distributions are. So a nucleus contains nucleons, nucleons contain gluons. So this actually is looking at the finer structure in the nucleus. And this is uh, uh, referred to as the CGC uh, approach. It's actually a QCD calculation of how the matter is distributed in the overlap re uh, region. Um, and what you find is you also sort of find this lumpiness, but the size of the lumps are much smaller in the uh, CGC approach compared to the nucleon uh, approach. And the simple reason for that is the size of the nucleon is determined by something called the saturation scale, which is a typical momentum. Momentum tra translates the size according to the uncertainty pr uh, principle. And that saturation scale and the implied sizes are much smaller than the size of uh, a nucleus, uh, a nucleon. Right? It's typically about five, five times smaller, which means that your lumps have a much more fine structure in this approach of modeling the initial state or the initial anisotropy. Uh, compared to this approach. And uh, the question we had in our field for a long time is which approach is correct? Do you treat this overlap area as a summation of nucleons, or do you treat the overlap area as, as a summation of gluons? Yeah, but well, there's, there's certainly differences in, in terms of when you try to calculate things from this overlap area. So one thing you can do is, is calculate uh, the, uh, this is referred to as the second order eccentricity. So this eccentricity is zero if you have a circle, right? And if you have an almond shape, it, it goes between zero, zero and one. And essentially, if you use these different approaches, this MC Glauber, that, which treats things in terms of nucleons, and the IP Glasma, that treats things on, on the basis of gluons, you get different results for the eccentricity. These fluctuations affect how almond shape like your initial overlap uh, region is. Um, and it's a pretty dramatic uh, difference. So the MC Glauber calculation, this is shown as the green, and uh, the blue is uh, the, the IP Glasma, or the CGC uh, calculation. So um, the thing to take away from this is the eccentricity uh, is something that's sensitive, sensitive enough to, to the size of these structures in the overlap uh, collision. And these aren't the only two approaches. So I mentioned uh, uh, the Monte Carlo Glauber. Uh, I mentioned something called IB Glasma and CGC. There's lots of ways of, of modeling this. Um, and it's kind of a big question in our field. Some are more phenomenological, which MC Glauber is, right? It's not a fundamental calculation. It's just throwing nucleons uh, uh, in the nucleus and seeing what happens afterwards. And some are more based in, in QCD. And some are the co some combination of both. And, a big thing in our field is testing all of these models to see which, which is more appropriate. What can we learn about essentially the shape of the nucleus? Now, um, I spoke about uh, this uh, momentum anisotropy. And it's something that we can measure very, very straightforwardly. Right? We're just measuring the momentum of the produced particles with respect to their direction using our detectors. It, it's very straightforward. Um, at least we think it is. Um, the, the, maybe the fine details are, are not so much. 
Um, so essentially what you do is you look at the angular distribution of particles and you can decompose this in, in, in a Fourier series and uh, the components of the Fourier series essentially tell you how strong the momentum anisotropy is. Uh, as I say, something we can measure with our detectors very straightforwardly, it just relies on momentum co conservation and, 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 and these sorts of uh, decompositions. Now, it turns out that the momentum anisotropy is proportional to the eccentricity, right? The thing I spoke about before, which hopefully makes sense, because if the eccentricity is zero, you get a circle, you're not going to get momentum an anisotropy. And this has been demonstrated with what we call hydrodynamical calculations, where the eccentricity is the input, you have uh, uh, um, a way of evolving the system using QGP sort of you know, fundamental properties. And you get this factorization. So um, the Vn is what we measure. The eccentricity is, is the initial state. And this kappa n is the response of the medium. It's essentially how efficient the QGP is at converting this initial state anisotropy to a momentum anisotropy. And this relation holds for the second and the third orders. When you get to higher orders, it, it doesn't work so well. This is an actual, the results of the calculation, where th this is kind of the measured momentum anisotropy, and this is the initial state uh, uh, anisotropy. And, and you see it's very, very linear. So the kappa reflects how efficient the system is, which in itself depends on, on the intrinsic properties of the QGP. If the QGP was a, an ideal gas, if there were no interactions, this kappa would, would, would be zero. So when it's high, it corresponds to a, a fluid that, that has a lot of interactions. Now, um, the pretty cool thing about this is, as I say, we can measure these, these momentum anisotropies, and we refer to them as VNs. Uh, when we measure them, what we end up getting is, is something like this. So these are the things that we can actually measure. Uh, these momentum anisotropies fluctuate, uh, and when we measure them, we can measure something called VN2, which basically is the average anisotropy plus uh, uh, the amount that it's fluctuating, and we can measure VM4, which is the average, minus the amount it's fluctuating, and there are higher orders. You can define very similar variables for the eccentricities, right? So you can have this eccentricity 2, which is the average eccentricity plus a contribution from fluctuations, this EM4, which is the average eccentricity minus a contribution from fluctuations. Now the point of it is, if you believe in this relation, you can show that this quantity that we can measure, this Vn4 over Vn2, is approximately the same as this quantity uh, Em4 over uh, Em2. So this is what we measure in our detector. This is what comes from the, uh, the initial state. It's the way that we can directly measure what, what's going on. Now, if you have strong fluctuations, so if this Vn is changing quite a bit in each different collision, uh, uh, this thing is zero. If you have weak fluctuations, uh, this thing is one. So if you, if you always measure the same anisotropy, it would be one, but that's, we don't believe that's going to be the case because this thing's always changing in, in, in the different types of collisions. Okay, so uh, I kind of started the, uh, uh, well, when I started the presentation, I said, well, there's two main models that we looked at, which is better at modeling the in initial conditions, and there's lots of ways to test them. This is quite a famous way where they basically take both sets of initial conditions, they have a model that evolves the, the QGP, and then they have a free parameter that controls whether you have this IP glasma or CGC type or, or a Monte Carlo glaber type. Um, fits the data essentially indicate that this, uh, uh, that this, you have a P of zero, which means uh, 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 that this, this sort of approach has been favored. So this notion that the gluons of the re relevant degrees of freedom in the initial state se seems to work. Um, so IP Glasma, this was a model that first tried to do this. Um, they've, uh, there's been a much, much better development in, in my point of view, uh, essentially making this model a, a little bit fundamental. I don't want to go into to the details uh, uh, so much, but um, it, it, some people were able to, to calculate these eccentricities, as I say, in a much more fundamental way. And um, the outcome of their approach is the fluctuations of the eccentricities, which I spoke about before, uh, were simply controlled by the saturation scale, the, the size of the gluon. And um, 
they've uh, been able to fit the data to very nicely in, in, in this scheme. So these are measurements of uh, uh, V2.2 and V2.4. The difference of these is due to the uh, fluctuations of the momentum anisotropy. Um, what was very interesting about this is they were able to do it for two different collision energies. These saturation scales I'm ta I spoke about, they, they should change as the collision energy changes of the collided nucleons. And they were able to, to capture that change uh, in, in, in their approach. So it seems this notion of the colour glass condensate and, and this, this notion of gluons being the degrees of freedom in the nucleus that control the shape of the nucleus, at least at the LHC, uh, it seems to have, have won out. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Yeah? <laughs> it's, it's a rare occurrence. The, uh, England won the Cricket World Cup. Right? Uh, it's not going to happen again in my lifetime, I think, which is kind of sad to, sad to hear. Um, now, what, what's interesting is, is people actually try to adjust the Monte Carlo Glauber uh, initial state calculations. So the Monte Carlo Glauber initial state calculations, they assume nucleons are the degrees of freedom. Uh, some people said, well, let's take this framework, and instead of using nucleons, we'll use the quarks within the, the, the nucleons as the degree of freedom. So essentially what you do is you add more, more fine structure. Um, and um, what, what we see here is basically this measured momentum anisotropy divided by the uh, uh, initial state uh, spatial anisotropy. And this is from a hydro calculation. If you show this as a function of the density of the system, you see this nice scaling uh, for n of 2 and, and uh, n of 3. Now, what's interesting is if you add, as I say, if you add finer structure within the nucleons, so um, if you say this initial state is not controlled by the nucleons but the quarks in the nucleons, um, and you look to see uh, uh, how well the scaling works, uh, uh, on the right, um, uh, this is what happens when we, when we put five quarks in to a particular nucleon, uh, and this is where we have just nucleons. So this scaling kind of failed in the Monte Carlo, uh, Carlo Glauber scheme, where it was traditionally implemented. But when you add finer structure in the forms of what we refer to as constituent quarks, this thing uh, got much better. And it's all pointed to this, the fact that uh, the best way to describe the shape of the nucleus at the LHC is, again, to, to, to have, have this sort of finer structure. So now I want to move on to measurements of an isotropic flow, not in lead-lead collisions, but in proton-proton collisions and proton-lead collisions. Now, number one, these were not expected to create the QGP. Uh, they were expected to be, be reference data. Uh, but it turns out nature fooled us uh, a little bit. I won't go into the details of these measurements too much, but they're measurements of angular correlations which can be affected by anisotro uh, momentum anisotropies in, 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 uh, 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 in the system. And essentially, when you have collisions where you produce a lot of particles, way more on average in a proton-lead collision or a proton-proton collision, you started to see these cosine uh, uh, two delta phi structures. Um, uh, this is uh, it's, it's probably more clearly seen in proton lead, and, and you see it in proton-proton. Which is an indication that these momentum anisotropies occur in these smaller systems, where we never thought they would occur uh, uh, before the LHC started running. So we saw these structures, and we decided to do the same measurements in heavy ion collisions as we did in proton-proton and uh, 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 sorry, do the same measurements in proton-proton collisions and, and proton-lead collisions as we did in heavy ion collision. This is a, a recent result from the Alice collaboration. So these are the, uh, this is the, um, the, the second order flow here for lead-lead, the second order flow here for xenon-xenon, the third order flow and the fourth order flow. When you measure these things in, in the smaller systems, which is, uh, uh, which is this part of the plot, you see somewhat similar characteristics. First, you see the second order flow is always bigger than the third, and the third is always bigger than, uh, than the fourth. So it, uh, we could, number one, measure something. Number two, it, what we see in the small systems actually looks like what's going on in, in the large systems. 
And then the question is, well, how is this, uh, how is this momentum anisotropy generated in the small system? Is it generated by a QGP or is there some other mechanism? Uh, there was actually another mechanism that was proposed and the idea is that the incoming uh, protons or the incoming protons in the nuclei, they have um, in the CGC framework, uh, what, what, what's referred to as colour domains. And um, so you'd have these domains of colour where the, the, the colour field would point in a particular way, right? And then if you have more quarks and gluons hitting these things, they would get scattered in a way where the momentum distribution would make them appear to, to flow, right? So you could measure a momentum anisotropy, this was expected, but it wouldn't be proportional to the eccentricity, which is kind of the QGP explanation. And I remind you again, uh, the QGP explanation, which we use hydrodynamics to, 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 to try and understand, assumes that the uh, uh, eccentricity, um, the momentum anisotropy is simply proportional to the initial state eccentricity. This is referred to the geometry uh, uh, interpretation in our field because it's related to the ge geometry. This is referred to an uh, initial state because it's just driven by the, the colour fields in the initial state. So um, you would have lead lead over here, you would have proton proton and P lead over here. And they were like, well, maybe we see QGP here, we see non-QGP effects like these momentum correlations here, and somehow it's all a nice smooth evolution from, from one, to, one to the other. It turned out that this is actually not the case. Uh, so this is a paper released, uh, uh, published by Nature Physics um, uh, this year, and uh, it's measurements by the Phoenix Collaboration, so not at the LHC, but at RIC, um, where they looked at these ana uh, momentum anisotropies versus the momentum of, uh, 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 of the particles themselves, and they found um, models uh, assuming a QGP-like response described the data uh, quite well. And um, this is for proton gold, D gold, and, and, and helium free gold. What was pretty remarkable about this is these predictions actually came before the data was, was even uh, made public. So they really were predictions, not, not, not post-dictions. And calculations from initial, uh, initial state momentum correlations, this was the competing explanation. These do not describe the data very well. They say that these anisotropy versus momentum should go up and then go down, and this is just not feature this is just not a feature that we see in the data. So this QGP-like interpretation, which again surprised us, seems, seems to have won. Um, very similar measurements were done at the, uh, uh, at the LHC. Uh, again, the, uh, the momentum anisotropies versus uh, the momentum of the particles themselves. And, and again, I won't go through each plot, but, but we see a good description from the hydrodynamic models, which assume this sort of QGP-like uh, 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 response. So what does, what does this all mean? What do we do with it? Okay, so maybe we've discovered QGP-like mechanisms in proton-proton collisions. How can that be of use, right? We didn't, expect them to, we didn't expect to see them there, but we have. What can, it, what can these tell us about the proton in itself? Well, if this, this geometry interpretation uh, 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 is, is valid, uh, essentially, these measurements of momentum anisotropies should give us access to whatever stru substructures exist in, in the protons. Right? They give us access to the substructures that were uh, uh, in, in the nucleus, we think, and it should work for the protons. And these are two different approach, uh, approaches to how the proton might look like. Uh, this is a smooth proton, uh, and this is a proton where you have three, three valence quarks, you know, two up and, 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 and two down quarks. And immediately you can see that these two different shapes should probably give you different momentum anisotropies. Uh, and this is something that we can, we can test. Now, uh, an interesting exercise you can do, uh, and it's, it's reasonably simple, uh, even, even I can do this from a theoretical point of view. Um, if you remember, I, I talked about these, these, measurement, these ratios before of the momentum anisotropies, how they uh, give us some information about the initial state. Now, these, these ratios, you can measure them. Uh, these come from the initial state. And if you do some exercise where you simply sample the protons with uh, some points or uh, a number of sources, which are 
essentially fluctuations in the energy density. That, that's one way you can think of it. The more, the more hot spots that you have, or the more fluctuations, the, uh, uh, this affects this, 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 this ratio. So, and it affects it also the eccentricities themselves. When you have infinite number of these, all the eccentricities go to zero because you've got a spherical proton. And the fact that you have finite sources starts to make these uh, uh, funny shapes. Now, um, so, so these calculations led to this expression. As I say, this is something we can measure. And if we can measure this, there's actually a way to infer the number of these, these, these sources in, in the protons themselves. And this was done. And this was done by the Atlas uh, collaboration. This is what this NS is, based on their measurements. And um, their measurements imply that there are about 10 hotspots in a proton. Which, for those that pay attention, I hope doesn't make sense, because I started the whole presentation off saying there are three, three quarks in a proton. right? But at high energy, that picture is not so simple, because the quarks exchange gluons. Those gluons sometimes split into to what we call C quarks. So uh, these quarks exist for a very small amount of time. And as you increase energy, these processes, that, because of time dilation, uh, you're more likely to see these sort of virtual quarks that, or virtual things that pop up, pop up in these processes. So the structure of the proton, the LHC, is certainly more complicated than uh, uh, we might think. Now. Um, there's one way of looking at it, just by, uh, just by measuring uh, 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 this thing to, to get this thing. Another way is you can just momentum, measure the momentum anisotropies, and this is the number of particles that you produce. What was found um, in our modeling is, in order to describe the data, you actually had to have some sort of proton that also had these, these structures in it. So these are pred predictions where you assume the proton is round, and these are predictions where you assume the proton has, has these, this structure in it. And when you do so, you describe the data from the CMS collaboration much better uh, uh, compared to this approach. What was pretty amazing about this calculation is they took the same, the same initial conditions and they used it to try and describe incoherent diffraction of J-psi uh, cross-sections and EP collisions, which have nothing to do with the quark gluon plasma. Absolutely nothing to do, but they're sensitive to the initial shape of the proton. And they, I don't show it, but they found they, they could describe it very well with the same set of initial conditions as you do to describe the flow in, in proton. Actually, this is a proton leg collision. Moment. So, you know, what are, these, uh, 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 what are these sources? What are these hotspots? You just say the up and the down quarks, as I said before. What is the contribution from valence quarks? What is the co uh, contribution from gluons? Uh, the big question we have is in this, in this model, we have three hotspots. And in this model, uh, we have 10. So there's somewhat of an ambiguity. And, and, and we're asking these questions. And you know, ultimately, the answer has to come from QCD. This is the theory that should describe how many quarks uh, and gluons you have in a proton and what is the, the spatial distribution of them. Even though it hasn't ma managed to yet, it should be able to do it in, in principle. Um, so moving forward, uh, so the LHC, it plans to take more data. The experiments are all being upgraded at the moment in order to do so. Um, and there's always this kind of question, well, what, what new measurements uh, can we do? Um, now, I spoke about the saturation scale, this scale that controls the size of the uh, gluon in the nucleus. Um, it turns out this scale depends on the size of the nucleus itself. Right, so as you uh, have a bigger nucleus, you have a bigger Q squared, which essentially means you have um, uh, 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 a bigger size of the uh, of the gluon. And then when you start to decrease the size of the nucleus, th this starts to change. So by probing different species, you're able to test this this picture that described the heavy ion flow measurements uh, quite well uh, in, in, in even more detail. Um, we're also interested in installing a new forward detector. So um, we measure everything perpendicular to the beam. But uh, people are interested in measuring particle productions along the beam, so to speak. And it turns out the saturation scale also depend, depends on that. So by installing a, uh, a detector, yeah, you can also sort of probe uh, uh, this, sort of, this sort of thing. 
Uh, future facilities, so the LHC, I mean, more data is going to come, which is great. Uh, the one I really hope uh, uh, starts to move uh, uh, a little bit more quickly is uh, this electron ion collider. So um, I won't go into too much details, but there's another way to probe the substructure of the nucleus and proton, and that's to collide electrons in there, right? And um, there is a facility that's proposed. It's either going to be built at Brookhaven National Lab or at Je Je Jefferson Lab. We don't know yet. But what we did do as a community is we pushed it to the national academies and we said, is this a good idea or not? And they said it was a fantastic idea, uh, which we then hope the Department of Energy is going to tell the politicians, give, give us some more money to build it. But uh, there's a lot, been lots of money put into this already and most people expect it to, to be built. And it will be one of the, uh, one of the only new colliders actually built in, in the United States, which would be great. Um, all right, so let me summarize. Uh, you know, for me, one of the ultimate goals of our field, it, uh, if, you can actually, if we can actually calculate the shape of the nucleus and proton in terms of quantum chromodynamics, this would be a fantastic achievement. I don't think we're there yet. We've actually used quantum chromodynamics to determine the mass of a proton and a neutron, but we don't know the distribution of matter in the proton and neutron itself. And that's different to the hydrogen atom, where you know from Schrodinger's equation where the electron is, or the probability where, where it is, to quite a high precision. That's not the same thing for a proton or, uh, or a nucleus. But I think we're getting there. Uh, I think you know, there's been good progress with heavy ion flow measurements using these CGC-based initial conditions to describe these uh, initial anisotropies. And the, the fluctuations of the momentum anisotropies uh, will provide, I think they do provide good access to these saturation scales. There's been compelling evidence that the flow that we see in small system is driven by geometry. Uh, I believe this sh has shown it's a, perhaps a valuable means to access the structure of the proton. And there's also a question regarding the nature of the substructures, what they are. And I can only say more measurements will, will help in that regard. So that's it. Thank you very much.